best part about Starfield is that all of it just works. All of this just works. It's not, I'm not kidding. The combat is mediocre. The dogfighting is average. The quest design is antiquated. Exploration is flat. The companions exist. And the writing is bland. All Starfield does is, it just works. It doesn't do anything beyond that. It doesn't innovate. It almost doesn't even try being fun. And it has absolutely no respect for the player's time. Because for every one thing that works, there's another thing that doesn't. Like the UI is garbage. Uh, do you have a favorite Skyrim mod? Well, there's a number I like. I, on the PC, the UI one is really, really good. The game is a little janky. Digi picking is tedious. Some of the certification requirements are downright stupid. Take shield damage? How is that a challenge? Good question, Todd. I found the crafting to be somewhat worthless, and it's nearly impossible to immerse yourself into this galaxy. Believe me, I tried. I feel like one of the patterns I've noticed from this entire generation of gaming is the more content a game has, the more bland it is. Because all of the game's mechanics need to be shaved down and robbed of their depth in order to accommodate all of that content, to ensure that it's playable for each and every player. And Starfield is a perfect example of that. To be fair, I really don't hate Starfield but I don't love it either. It's impossible for me to like something that has no soul. But I was told by several people that the game doesn't get good until you've played it for 10 hours. And so hitting that 10 hour mark became my goal. One of the first things I noticed is that this game has an insane amount of loading screens. Fast travel to a quest location, loading screen. Once you get there, you go inside the building where your quest is located, loading screen. So what I did to circumvent this was during a load screen, I played Dungeon Hunter 6, today's sponsor from the creators of Dungeon Hunter 1, Dungeon Hunter 2, Dungeon Hunter 3, Dungeon Hunter 4, and Dungeon Hunter 5 comes Dungeon Hunter 6, a free-to-play mobile game where you can make the bosses serve you like a butler or your mommy. After defeating a boss, you can loot them, ride them, or summon them onto the battlefield to become members of your squad, a feature that our very own US military is looking into in order to convert the enemy over to our side. And these bosses will follow you anywhere, like a butler, or your mommy, and they can perform combo skills. In the late game, you can even shape shift into these bosses. You can also turn into a cat for a stealth mission, who is inspired by a real life cat that lives with the developers. There's also a customizable mount system, which was inspired by one of the developer's dogs who mounted that very same cat. Dungeon Hunter 6 has some pretty solid graphics and character animations. It looks a little bit like League of Legends, but without all the toxicity. In Dungeon Hunter 6, you can play with guildmates and battle one another, test a variety of builds with skill tree options, and trade items through an auction system. These are all features that Starfield doesn't have. If you scan the QR code or check the description, you can download the game for free on your telephone. And if you use my link, you'll get all sorts of stuff in the game that would normally cost somebody else $50. But not you, because you watch, what's it? Ren's Reviews, so that's it. Make sure to download the game if you want to. And big thanks to Dungeon Hunter 6 for the sponsorship. Now let's get back to the video. Normally, I don't put any effort into how my in-game characters look, but today that changes. I wanted to truly immerse myself into this game and enjoy it to its fullest. So I spent 20 minutes crafting the most feared and revered obese bounty hunter in the galaxy, Corbus Dunwich. He has heavy thighs, but light fingers, as he steals everything under his nose, picking and pocketing as he pleases. <laughs> This actually became one of the most fun parts of Starfield for me. I thought it was kind of funny that I could pick the president's pocket. Oh yeah, see that's cool, I just stole from the president. And it made me think how easy it would be to pick Joe Biden's pocket in real life. Wait, wh what's this? The door here needs a key. Well, this guy right next to it has the key, so let me just uh, pluck that from his pocket. Now he's ordinarily the only person in the galaxy that can open this door. But as I open it right in front of him, he doesn't seem to notice. Doesn't seem to care that someone is traipsing through his private property and going through all his belongings. Because nobody ever expects the fat guy. I stole everything he had, five feet from where he sat. I wasn't quite sure what to do yet, so I figured I'd get started on the main questline, and this was where I met Sarah. Every night I hold you in my dreams, 
my heart skipped a beat as I skipped through her dialogue because I could read her words faster than she could say them. I felt a bit of a spark between the two of us. In fact, there were literal sparks between us as this display thing turned on. But my goodness, what a woman. The way she stiffly walked made me stiff as well. With nervousness, of course. And you know what? Her smile didn't creep me out as much as the other characters' smiles did. I wanted her to be mine. And I knew I could trick her into falling in love with a hottie like me. I knew that I could make her part of my Corbus Dunwich sandwich. And since I was desperately seeking companionship, I made her my companion right there on the spot. And it became my goal to fully romance her, marry her, and immediately abandon her just to prove to you guys how meaningful and banal the relationships in this game are. It was love at first sight, with the idea that I had. I just had no idea what this relationship would end up blossoming into. Love is kind of funny like that. When I was in the city of New Atlantis here, I stumbled onto a mission board where I snagged four quests and I figured that I'd start with these. This turned out to be quite the mistake because I'm pretty sure that these were all just procedurally generated quests as they're all incredibly bland and basic. They had me going to a place and killing a guy, going to another place and giving something to a guy, or going to a planet and fully scanning it. This is where I was tutorialized on how to scan things, which is as simple as pointing at an item and hitting the E key. So you know, I start scanning stuff. I scammed the same plant thing here like eight times over until a meter filled up all the way to 100%. Then I did an internal scan of my own body and it didn't look good. The readings came back with terminal amounts of boredom, but I had to get a 100% scan of this planet for the quest, which consisted of me running around the joint, scanning eight trees, eight flowers, and eight of each life form. So that's eight individual hunter crabs, eight of the other crabs that I don't remember the name of, and eight beetles, which meant I spent spent about 30 minutes traipsing around this lifeless planet just praying to God, aka science, that a little beetle would spawn so that I could scan it and finish this godforsaken quest. I scanned everything I possibly could, and all these meters looked pretty full to me. Everything was green, but somehow I was stuck at 95%. I don't know, guess it must have been a bug. It certainly wasn't a beetle, so I just left. Five hours in and I've yet to find the fun. But hey, only five to go until it starts getting good. To give credit to Bethesda, the scanning mechanic does serve a valuable purpose. Ordinarily, when you land on an undiscovered world, the game's idea of exploring said world is to run towards a landmark in a straight line. But what the scanner does is it gives you something to do on your way towards that landmark, turning that straight line into a ziggy zag which is probably the saddest bit of game design I've ever seen. But honestly, I didn't feel the need to explore any of these planets at all because every planet I had been to was practically barren. You see that mountain over there? Well, you can climb it. So I did, in order to prove my point. And after fumbling around for five minutes, getting stuck on little rocks in the ground, I'd finally made it to the top, where I was treated to a spectacular vista. Wouldn't this just be a gorgeous landscape for an early access game? Nothing here piques my curiosity. Nothing is beckoning to be explored. And it's like that on a majority of the planets. They all look so bland and lifeless. And you visit so many of these gigantic planets that feel like they were procedurally generated rather than handcrafted. And procedural generation is fine in a roguelite or a random game mode, but when one of your game's sole tenants is exploration, procedural generation is a malignancy. Because who wants to explore a place that is as flat and drab looking as this? I know for a fact that my efforts of exploration would not be properly rewarded. I visited a couple of caves and military bases and found practically nothing. So why bother? As I completed random quests, I was able to familiarize myself with the combat. And you know what? I actually thought the combat was pretty decent. The guns feel decent, and there's a pretty decent variety of guns to choose from, with lasers, scopes, shotguns, pistols, miniguns, 
and all sorts of stuff. Thanks to that, I was able to mess around with a bunch of different weapons throughout my playthrough, which kept things feeling fresh. I like that you have a little boost pack, which allows you some extra mobility to get above enemies. It's a nice little addition to the sandbox, and it's pretty fun to use. What isn't fun to use is the combat slide. This has got to be the absolute worst combat slide I've ever experienced in a video game. When you tap the crouch button from a full-on 12 mile per hour sprint, all you do is slide like two feet. It's embarrassing and positively worthless. And mind you, this is an ability that you're required to purchase with a skill point, but it costs four skill points to even unlock the ability to unlock this ability. I thought some of the alien designs looked really cool though. These sunflower creatures were really neat, and these stone aliens were kind of awesome. They genuinely surprised me the first time I saw them. But unfortunately, the aliens aren't very fun to fight. They tend to just run towards you in a straight line, and different species don't seem to have different behaviors, really. They usually just die after taking a handful of shots, and if they end up giving you too much trouble, you can just use your boosters to get up to some high ground, and then they really can't do anything to you at all. It's pretty subpar gameplay. The AI for human enemies is also not very good. But it's far from the worst I've seen over the past couple years. Sometimes enemies have no idea you exist. Maybe their pathfinding breaks and they can't get to you. Sometimes, despite being in the heat of combat, they'll just be sitting down. At one point, the AI in my brain broke, and I emptied nine shotgun rounds into the back of Sarah's head, thinking she was the enemy. The combat is fun, but I don't see it being fun for 30 plus hours of gameplay. The knowledge you ask for isn't evil. No knowledge is. It's we who bend it to evil ends. Oh, you must assure me this will be used to save lives, not endanger them. Yeah, yeah, you have my word. I'll make sure it's used for good. Yeah, sure, I'll pick that. I'll pick that. As the chair of Constellation, I take personal responsibility in vouching for this man's integrity. He'll keep his word. Yeah, whatever, lady. You were singing a completely different tune about 30 seconds ago when I was picking this guy's pockets. Don't make me an accessory to your crimes. But I was impressed by the finer details that the environmental team were able to put into this game. This was something I was able to appreciate throughout a majority of my playtime, actually. Certain locations had this handcrafted feel to them thanks to small additions like this. And this. Then later, I felt like an idiot because I spent about a minute or so flying directly towards a planet, fully expecting to be able to actually fly into its atmosphere. You can't do that. I guess I thought that because No Man's Sky allowed you to physically travel from one planet to the other, that Starfield would be able to do that as well. And no Man's Sky pulled this tech off eight years ago with a small team of like 15 developers, but I guess Bethesda with their unlimited budget and all the time in the world just couldn't make it happen. So instead of playing the video game and actually flying to a planet, I need to open up my map and navigate through menus to get to it. It doesn't feel like one big cohesive galaxy when everything is separated by a series of loading screens and menu navigation. I was also surprised that you couldn't fly your spaceship within a planet's atmosphere. It's just planted wherever you chose to land it, which is unfortunate because exploration on an undiscovered planet usually just entails you having to, you know, walk in a straight line towards a landmark. And not only is it time consuming, but it's also pretty boring. It would have been so cool to have been able to fly all over the planet, you know? And maybe there could be these massive flying aliens that you could only kill with your spaceship. That would have been pretty cool. But hey, you know what? Walking in a straight line is pretty good too. But really, how cool would it be if you could just point your spaceship in the general direction of a planet, activate your light speed, seamlessly warp to that planet, then once you're there, just land wherever you want to with no loading screens and no menus. That would make traversal feel so fluid and seamless, and the universe would feel more believable and connected. Whereas now it's so disconnected, clunky, and involves you opening up several menus. Menus that are unintuitive and annoying to navigate. I'm pretty sure you spend a majority of your playtime in conversation. I mean, these are essentially the game's cutscenes, and I must have sat through 12 hours of them. You're expected to stare at a static shot of an NPC while they go on a three minute monologue as they stiffly gesticulate which gets really boring really quickly. Ordinarily in a game of this size like The Witcher or Mass Effect, you'll at the very least get a shot reverse shot to keep things engaging. But in Starfield, all you get is shot. Uh, your timing could be better. I'll just take a moment to check up on my patient. Can't see. 
you just get this one camera angle. Sometimes, if you're lucky, the camera would jarringly cut to your companion mid-conversation. This happens with such rarity that it never feels like a smooth cut. And it can be kind of janky. Sometimes she wouldn't even be in the room with us. Whoa! She's, she's outside downstairs listening in to the conversation. Or sometimes her character model wouldn't even spawn in all the way. It should. You risk, though I have had my own personal struggles with the United Colonies. I'm happy for you. And sometimes she would just stand in front of whoever I was talking to, which is really rude, but I'll forgive her because she's my girl, you know? So in conversation, you can choose to be good, snarky, or dismissive. But these choices have no bearing on the overall plot or the perception that the NPC you're talking to has on you, apart from their reactionary line of dialogue being slightly different. You can be more right. The attacks were a correction. When I discovered the plant, I did consider handing over what I'd found. Hmm. The attacks were a correction. When I discovered the plant, I did consider handing over what I'd found. So if these choices have no consequences, then how are they even choices to begin with? They give the illusion of freedom where there is none. A false sense of control over the conversation. The one exception to this rule is, of course, the persuasion mechanic, where you can persuade people to do things for you if you choose the correct phrases. And as basic as it is, I kind of like this, because it forced me to actually use my brain during conversations rather than just reading through dialogue. But as the game continued, I realized that the persuasion mechanic was purely based on chance, with an invisible persuasion percentage meter dictating whether or not each phrase I chose would work, meaning that all I had to do was repeatedly click the green options since they rarely ever failed. And this game has over 250,000 lines of dialogue, which is just far too many. It's more than enough to spread your writing team pretty thin. While I was live streaming this game here on my channel, I accidentally meleeed an innocent civilian. I decided to just roll with it and kill as many people as I could until I died. And I had an absolute blast. That looks like Todd Howard. Eat it. It became tradition for me to end every one of my play sessions with a massive killing spree. So with 10 hours under my belt, I felt that I had a pretty solid understanding of this game, and I was ready to tackle its meat, the faction quests. So I enlisted with the Vanguard to get the ball rolling, and I actually thought that the Vanguard quest line was pretty interesting. As somebody on Reddit said, it has depth, moral choices, and plot twits. But none of that actually matters, and I'll get into why that is in a little bit. First, I was tasked with bringing multiple factions together in order to defeat a common enemy known as the Terror Morph, the most cleverly named entity in science fiction since Unobtainium or Transformium. Terror Morphs have been spontaneously appearing on nearby planets and killing settlers. They have the ability to get inside your head and give you auditory hallucinations, which makes people go crazy, morphing their brains to think thoughts of terror. So this girl that's with me here, this is Hadrian. She's a clone. Her dad died in some battle, right? Except he didn't die. The government faked his death and hid him in a swanky prison like he was Hannibal Lecter. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our first plot twits. Now buckle up for the debt. You see, there's these things called heat leeches, and they're relatively harmless, unless they're exposed to a certain pollen, which will cause them to morph into terror morphs. Now these heat leeches are all over the galaxy, meaning they can be used as a weapon of sorts if somebody were to emit that pollen in a heat leech dense area. And so this guy Sanon, he apparently micro-engineered this entire quest line so that you, and most notably his daughter, would walk away from the whole ordeal as heroes, so that he could bring honor to his family name. In doing so, he pinned all of his crimes on some other guy. Some other guy that he had me kill earlier in the quest. Like I told you, it's pretty interesting stuff. Yet despite how interesting some of it was, its storyline was purely delivered through conversation. And you could have the most interesting story that's ever been written, but when it's told through the mouth of an overly Botoxed NPC, who talks at such a slow pace and leaves these gargantuan pauses in between each 
sentence so that the game can load up the next line of dialogue while the camera remains completely static, it's robbed of all of its emotion which makes it even harder to stay engaged. And while I was somewhat invested with this quest storyline, there's only so much of this I can take. At the end of the quest, I had the choice to either have the science lab engineer a chemical that would kill all of the heat leeches in the galaxy, or bring an extinct species that eats terror morphs back into the ecosystem. And I chose the latter, because I thought it would be cool to see these creatures roaming around every once in a while. But it turns out that neither choice has any effect on the overall galaxy for the player. I've been told that there is a random encounter where you can find the UC deploying that extinct species onto a planet, but that's about it. Apart from that, everything is exactly the same as it was before you completed this quest. And so, once again, we've been given the illusion of choice. But if our choices have no consequences, then what is the point of giving us a choice in the first place, other than to simply choose our own adventure? Now this quest line seemed promising. I was meant to go undercover and infiltrate the largest criminal organization in the galaxy, the Crimson Fleet. I was told by my commander that I would have to make several morally gray decisions as I did so. Sounds pretty cool, but it was a bit tough to get invested. So first of all, here I am infiltrating an organization of rough and tumble criminals with a stiff British lady beside me who appears to have been born with a silver spoon so big you'd swear to God it was a ladle. She's clean, she's blonde, doesn't have a single scar on her face, and she's still a virgin. Or at least she better be. She doesn't fit in with this crowd of criminals at all. Realistically, she would have blown my cover. But hey, whatever. The quest must go on, right? After gaining their trust by collecting somebody's debt, they let me in on their little ruse, which was neither little nor a ruse. There are untold amounts of wealth just sitting out there in a spaceship, ripe for the taking. Think of it like a pirate's treasure. Obtaining this money would be huge for the Crimson Fleet. So to get clues as to where the treasure is located, we go to an icy cave and pick up a recording which contains those very clues. And those clues led us to a gala. But not just any old gala, it's the kind of gala with those extra expensive fancy balloons that you can walk on top of. The type of gala where you can pull out your gun and open fire whenever you please. And no oh, baby were these the hottest pockets I ever did pick. But when it came time to actually complete the mission, that was when the quest design started showing its cracks. It mostly just boiled down to me following a waypoint and interacting with stuff. So the first thing I do is talk to the now penniless party people who told me that the guy in charge of the party Party has a mistress. I spoke to his mistress, who told me that the guy in charge has a second guy in charge. So I talked to the second guy in charge, and he gave me nothing. So I talked to the captain of the ship, who says that we could cause an emergency that would make everybody go to their cabins. So I go up and make that happen by simply flipping three switches. Then I go and talk to the second guy in charge again, who gives me evidence of the misdeeds of the main guy in charge. And now I can finally go and talk to the main guy in charge and confront him for being corrupt or whatever, which completed the mission. But from there, things got even more tedious. It's time to turn in that quest and get some juicy XP. So to do that, I have to fast travel all the way back to the Crimson Fleet ship, which triggers a loading screen. I dock into that ship, which triggers an unskippable cutscene. Once I'm there, I walk through a door, which triggers a loading screen. Then I run through the entire ship, find the quest NPC, and turn my quest back in with him. But now that that's done, I need to go check in with the good guys to tell them about the mission I just finished. So I fast travel over there, which triggers another loading screen. I dock into their ship, which triggers another unskippable cutscene. On my way to meet with the commander, there is of course an elevator that triggers another loading screen. Then I talk to the commander, who then gives me the next part of the quest that I need to fast travel to, which, of course, triggers another loading screen. And you're required to do this after completing each of the five to six missions that this quest line throws at you. The fact that the game is designed this way makes it feel like Bethesda has absolutely no respect for the player's time. Why can't I communicate with these NPCs through a secure line or by email? Why do I have to talk to everybody in person? This is such poor design, it's sickening. But luckily, Sarah's love was the shot of Pepto that I needed to keep me going. Right before the gala, my very own gala, Sarah, she opened up to me. She told me that during a battle in some war, her captain died. So she had to step in as captain, and she wound up making some bad decisions that ended up getting some of her crew killed. 
She even had to listen to some of them scream as their escape pod burned up in the atmosphere. She herself got into an escape pod and was stranded on the planet of Cassiopeia for a couple of years. And she's been blaming herself for those deaths ever since. I'm really pleased that she felt comfortable enough to tell me all that stuff. I don't know, I guess there's just something about me that seems trustworthy or something. Maybe it's all those pockets she watched me pick. Pickpocketing is a crime. Or have you forgotten? I was touched by her vulnerability. So when I saw that I had the option to flirt with her by telling her I loved her, I chose it. And I'm glad I did, because about an hour later, Sarah continued our heartfelt conversation. She said that she wanted to resolve her trauma and get closure by finding her crewmate's escape pod on Cassiopeia. And she wanted me to go with her. And yes, yeah, sure, it was nothing more than just heartless exposition, but my heart melted nonetheless. Of course I'll go to Cassiopeia with you, baby. Just let me go plunder this treasure first. I... I don't know what to say. The next important mission had me infiltrate some kind of science lab. The security here was pretty tight, but I put on a disguise and nobody in the place seemed to care that I was here. Nobody even bothered coming up to me to question me. I wound up persuading some idiot into letting me fly a spaceship out of there which had some fancy tech that the Crimson Fleet needed. For the mission after that, I found myself in another science lab of sorts, where I was faced with a dilemma. I could either sneak my way through the place nice and quiet-like, or go in guns blazing. But I actually didn't do either of those. Instead, I sprinted through the entire facility. Grabbed whatever MacGuffin I needed to grab and talked to whoever I was supposed to talk to. Oh, it's you. I was wondering how long it would take. If you want the encryption cipher, you're welcome to it. So the reason I had to go and get all this stuff is because the treasure we're looking for is in a spaceship. And that spaceship is in an electromagnetic field that destroys everything that goes inside of it. Except, of course, for the spaceship that's already in it. But now that we have our MacGuffins, we can finally go to the ship. Once inside, I killed all of the robots that were defending it and extracted the treasure. When suddenly the ship starts to buckle under the pressure of the electromagnetic field, this old gal is going down and we gotta run out of here to survive. I was sprinting for my life as pieces of the hole were ripped asunder, allowing dangerous radioactive chemicals to enter the spaceship and my fat little lungs. My character was struggling to breathe, hacking, coughing, and gasping for air as a yellow bar began encroaching on my white bar, meaning I only had seconds left before I perished. Things were getting tense now. This segment was almost genuinely exciting, but to progress I needed to unlock this door. And doing so pulled out my digipick and completely shattered all the pacing. Kinda like putting a YouTube ad in the middle of my sentence. Once I escaped the ship, I warped over to the UC crew to tell them the good news. But instead, I found myself in the middle of a massive dogfight, which was also almost exciting. I took down as many of the Crimson Fleet as I could. While some father and daughter who had become a part of my crew at some point without my knowledge or permission just started talking about some nonsense. Then I had to play another dogfight, and after winning that one, I had to participate in another one. And after that one, they threw in a fourth one for good measure. And this would have been fine if the dogfighting had any depth to it, but it doesn't really. It essentially just boils down to getting behind the enemy ship so that you can shoot them, but they can't shoot you. I think the dogfighting is dog water, and they just made me do it four times in a row. But afterwards, I was able to board the Crimson Fleet starship, where I killed everybody. And this actually felt somewhat satisfying. It was kind of impactful to be able to actually kill off important quest-giving characters. I made my way to Delgado and persuaded him to not kill himself. Fine. You win. And then to finish off my quest, I returned to the United Colonies spaceship as a legend. A legend who had rid the stars of the largest known criminal organization in the galaxy. So naturally, they gave me a hero's welcome. Bravo! Great job.
Like the Vanguard quest, I thought that the Crimson Fleet had some interesting elements to it, and I thought Delgado was a cool character. But it was bogged down again by the stiff presentation and the boring quest design. But with that done and dusted, it's finally time to attend my quest for Sarah. So off we went to Cassiopeia, where much like Tom Hanks, Sarah had been cast away for years. I just wish I could have been your volleyball, baby. I went inside the ship she used to call home and checked her emails to make sure she wasn't talking to any other men. But I also found the signal of her crewmate's escape pod. So I've been here for two minutes and I've already done what she failed to do in two years. Anyway, we follow the signal, find the shuttle, and when we go inside of it, there's a little girl in there. I'll shoot if I have to. She's the child of the mother and father who were stranded here due to Sarah's incompetence. She spent her entire life on Cassiopeia. I figured her parents would have named her Cassie to honor the beautiful planet which has gifted them with life and shelter. But instead, they named her Sona, after the son of a bitch that got them stranded on this planet. Ultimately, we made the decision to take Sona back home with us, and just like that, we already have our first child. Then we take her back to the lodge where she is to be neglected for the rest of my playthrough. And now, with her demons put behind her, Sarah wanted to meet me under a waterfall. Ooh la la, how romantic. We had quite the heart to heart here. No matter how hard I've tried to make them a part of my life, they tend to drift away and disappear. It's in my nature to keep people at arm's length. Or worse push them away. But I told her to ignore all that, that I love her now and forever. <sighs> Sorry, I, um, I just need a moment to gather my thoughts. Then I told her that I'd like to marry her. She seemed down with it. <laughs> you mean that? You'd do that? For me? So I figured that we would go get married right now, but that wasn't available for me yet. It looks like I was gonna have to wait for the final part of this quest to become available to me. And there's no sense in standing around, so I figured I'd get started on another faction quest. This quest was boring. The mission design was really starting to get to me here. Go grab some coffee, bring it back to the lady. Go upload a program on a rival corporation's computer. Go tell the lady that you uploaded a program on the rival corporation's computer. Go plant some evidence in a chest. Go tell the lady that you planted the evidence in a chest. It was so tedious. And these missions were a constant back and forth of fetching and questing. But luckily in the middle of it all, just as I was about to turn in another quest, Sarah wanted to talk to me. I'll admit I was a little nervous. I could tell by the way she was standing in that corner that this was gonna be an important conversation. And it was. Sarah took me up on my offer to get married. And I've decided I'd like Aja Mamasa to conduct our marriage ceremony. And now that I was confronted with this big commitment, I wasn't sure if I was ready. I thought back to all the times we spent together. That one puzzle we solved. Those men and women we killed. That one time I was inside of her. Out of the 22 hours I had spent in this game, she had been with me for 20. Which is more than enough time to know if you want to spend the rest of your life with someone. I'm ready, Sarah. I love you. I'm going to complete my corporate espionage, and then we're getting married. I'll admit it was tough to stay focused on this quest line. Perhaps the stress of our upcoming wedding was getting to me. But next to our love, everything about this quest felt so small and inconsequential didn't help knowing that whatever decisions I made wouldn't end up mattering all that much. The only thing that captured my interest was that at one point they installed this device in my head called the NeuroAmp, which allowed me to control other people's minds and have them do anything I want. But the only thing I want is you, baby. At the end of the quest, these corporate board members wanted to sell this mind control device to the public, which sounded like a bad idea. So what I did was I got everybody on the board on board for shelving the use of mind control technology by using mind control technology to convince them to do so. And so, with another quest line in the books, I could finally devote myself to marrying this woman. We flew to a nice tropical planet. The reception was small. Her mother was the only person that showed up. I wanted to invite all of you guys to the wedding, but there wasn't a dialogue option for that. Now, are we ready to begin the ceremony? Actually, uh, not yet. I have a few words that I would like to share first, but I had trouble putting my feelings into just simple words. 
So what I did was I put them into song and had somebody on Fiverr sing my lyrics for you. Sarah, when we first met, I couldn't help but notice an immediate click. And since then, there's been something in my pockets that I want you to pick. And baby, I just want you to know that I love your thin thighs and your green eyes that I can use you to store all my supplies and when I shoot guys you don't even try to help me baby all you do is stand by you take my breath away I need a respirator don't understand the way you leave the elevator talking around Pronounce you life mates. Congratulations! Aja, I don't know what to say. That was oh, amazing. I'm glad everything worked out for you, sir. And just like I promised, we'll have our consummation on Cassiopeia here, the planet where you were stranded all those years. And this is where I'll leave you. But while you're here, here on Cassiopeia, girl, I just hope you keep on loving me. Goodbye, Sarah. Things felt a little empty without Sarah by my side, but all I had left to do was one more faction quest and the main story. The final quest had to do with the Freestar Collective, which looked like some Wild West space cowboy stuff, and that sounded pretty cool. But so did the last three faction quests I did. I was determined to get through all of that content for this video, but playing this quest through the lens of regular old runs reviews wasn't going to cut it for me. I needed to shift my perspective, so I came up with a solution. If I were to keep my sanity while playing through this quest, I'd need to actually roleplay in this roleplaying game. So I completely engrossed myself in the character of a Louisiana space cowboy, and that did make this quest palatable for me. And by me, I mean Corbus Dunwich, Deputy of the Stars. <laughs> Now, I ain't no fancy schmancy video game developer, but I have played me a hefty plethora of video games, and I know bad quest design when I see it, especially when I've been seeing it for 20 plus hours. So for the first part of this quest, some gal at a farm was being attacked by bad folk. So I went on down to a crevice, twixt the rocks and boulders, tracking footsteps by hitting the E key, killing any old space critter that I saw along the way to earn what you gaming folk refer to as experience points. And when I found them bad fellers near that creek, I took the law into my own hands and killed them too. Got some more XP from them in the process, which tickled the innards of my southern chest. My grandpappy taught me that the best thing a man can do with his life is gain experience, but I ain't so sure that he was referring to filling up a progress bar in order to level up. See, he never played no video games on account of being dead. But now we got to find out how these fellers were able to get their mitts on a spaceship and fly on over here. So I ride my space horse into town and met a feller goes by the name of Ronald Hope. Says somebody stole his spaceship, but my gut tells me this guy's behind the entire quest line. That he set up everything. A safe guess though, seeing as how each and every quest has had at least one plot twist. So I figure out who done the theft by talking to some folks, and I confront the gal who stole his space horse. And when I do, she tells me to go somewhere else to see someone else, just like everyone else I ever done quested with. And so I do just that. My travels eventually led me to a place called the Red Mile. It's a space casino with gambling machines. Machines like slots, China's checkers, America's checkers, blackjack, and chess. But much like Fallout 76, these machines are unplayable, which shocked the grits right out of my belt buckle. 
because you could play them gambling games in New Vegas. But I suppose now the games have gotten so darn fancy, you'd have to be more foolish than a horse in heat to expect such a player-friendly feature in an AAA video game now, wouldn't you? So I'm told that to progress in this here quest, that I got to run the Red Mile, which simply consists of killing several critters and varmints, hitting a button, and running all the way back to where you started. Hardly was a challenge, and I found that if I used my boosting pack, them varmints could barely do nothing to me. I didn't have no fun here. I'd rather watch the Green Mile than have to run another red one. So then I go on over to another planet, kill some more people, and hey, look at that. She's got Tombstone on her. That there is one of my favorite movies. At the end of this mission, I get to a guy who tells me that Ron Hope was behind the farmer threateners all along. Well, who to thunk that? Ron Hope? But he's on the Council of Governors. There's no chance he'd be capable of such a thing. So I confront Ron Hope and end up sending him straight to heaven. Then I go to the marshal and tell him what I just got done telling all y'all. As a result of my heroism, they officially made me a ranger of the collective, gave me a nice shiny badge, a new space horse, and a gun. To celebrate my new status symbol, I thought it'd be mighty funny to start shooting at these people. So I did. <laughs> All I had to do now was finish up the game's story. So I was making my way through it as quickly as possible, doing the most basic missions you could think of like saving other members of the constellation and picking up some ancient alien artifacts that are the key to opening up the multiverse. On one of these missions, you go into a temple with no gravity in it and you float around collecting these little clusters that spawn. I guess it was kind of neat. I mean, zero gravity is always fun. But then as I was floating around here, I couldn't help but wonder why this game doesn't have dedicated zero gravity combat sections or platform segments even. It would be so cool to have gun battles with no gravity, but Bethesda decided not to do that, despite having all of the mechanics put in place for them to do so. And then for the ultimate slap in the face, at the end of this mission, I unlocked my first power, and this made me feel like absolute trash. Because here I've spent 25 hours going through a majority of the game's more substantial content, while having no idea that there were powers I could have been using this entire time to make things more interesting. I, I just feel like I missed out on so much now. This is legitimately upsetting to me. So of course I go to another temple to unlock another power. Another power which just makes the air around me safer to breathe. So I went through all these hoops and loading screens to get myself a glorified air purifier. I really don't see any use for this at all. Usually I'd just let my character inhale all the toxins and yeah, sure, he gets lung damage, but he eventually coughs it all out. If not, I'll just use one of the several inhalers I've pickpocketed to cure it right there on the spot. So if most powers are like this, then maybe I haven't been missing out on anything at all. As I kept slogging through the campaign, grabbing more artifacts and unlocking more powers, things started getting rough for me, and I began to mentally crumble. I really couldn't stomach any more Starfield. I felt that I had already experienced the best of what this game had to offer and that it would all be downhill from here. I was right. But here's something that's kinda weird. It really shouldn't work in this game's favor, but it kinda does. While I didn't have fun playing this game, I had an absolute blast making the video. I found myself actively wanting to play Starfield so that I could get more footage, which in turn would equate to more content for my video. So I found a lot of enjoyment in that, and in trying to turn this game into what is hopefully a watchable and potentially even an entertaining video. That's always been my goal with this channel. I don't care if you agree or disagree with whatever I have to say, creating something entertaining is all I ever wanted to do. So if I need to play a bad game to make that happen, then so be it. But you know what, despite how much I didn't like the game, there is a special feeling and just carving out a few afternoons to dedicate your life to a game like this. It reminded me of when I was a kid and I had just gotten Morrowind for the first time, playing through that and discovering everything that it had to offer. And I did get some of that from this game. Every once in a while there was a glimmer of that old classic Bethesda magic, but it was buried under pounds and pounds of jank. And if I didn't have this channel, I probably would have stopped playing Starfield after like four hours and I never would have looked back. But now I was so close to finishing this game. I slogged through quests that had me doing nothing more than picking up artifacts and collecting star clusters and temples to gain powers. Powers that I would never use, like having the ability to see star stuff. 
For the last power I collected, I didn't even check the menu after I unlocked it to see what it did. That's when I knew it was time to move on. One of the final missions was kinda neat though, it had me hopping in between dimensions to make my way through this laboratory and turn off an experiment that had gone wrong. It made me think a little bit for once. But then after that, for the final mission, I was just forced to fight a bunch of bad guys in what felt like six or seven separate four minute long combat encounters. And when I got to the final boss, instead of outright fighting him, I persuaded him, which saved me from having to do another four minutes of combat. So now I had every single artifact. All I had to do was assemble them in my ship and fire up my grav drives to activate them and complete the game. So I took the reins of my captain's chair. They call it a space bar because it takes you out to space. And then... My game crashed and sent me to my desktop. So I went back in, held that space bar to go to space, fired up my grav drives, and... Whoa, this room actually looks pretty awesome. We're at the center of the multiverse, kind of like the Flash from the film The Flash. And this is the first location in all of Starfield that has genuinely captivated me. And speaking of me, that's me. You made it. I hope you're enjoying the view. I never get tired of staring at it. Eternity. At this point, I could either choose to go into the center of the universe in order to ascend and become a member of the Starborn, or walk away and return to regular life. A classic red pill, blue pill situation. I chose to walk into the center. It was over. My relief was boundless. After 32 hours, I was finally done with this game. The fact that there's like 30 or maybe even 50 more hours of content in Starfield is baffling to me, because it more than overstayed its welcome with the 32 I put into it. There's simply just not enough depth in any of this game's playstyles to remain engaging for such a long time. They're all too broad and shallow. The persuasion mechanic is a mere game of chance. The combat is nothing more than just mindless shooting and basic movement. The currency was pointless. I never needed to buy anything because the game just gave me every single item I would ever need through quests. The quest design is boring as ever and there are hundreds of quests to complete. Planet scanning is insanely tedious and I would argue that this isn't even content but busy work. Yet there's over 1600 planets that you can scan. While that might be fun for a small handful of people, a majority the majority of players are going to end up ignoring that mechanic. 1600 planets is far too many, and it's just impossible to make that much content feel fun and fresh all the way through. Bigger is not better. It's impressive, I'll give them that, but quality is always more important than quantity when it comes to video games. I mean seriously, just imagine if they had given the same exact amount of time and resources to a smaller game with 50 planets or even 25 planets. Todd Howard decided to become a god Howard and created an entire universe, which again is impressive in its own right. But these days, video games struggle to maintain a good level of fun and engagement when all they contain is, say, the city of Tokyo, for example, or the city of London, or a tropical island, let alone an entire galaxy. Sure, we can craft amazing linear campaigns and, at rare times, believable and entertaining dynamic open worlds. Out of the damn way! God damn! Are you crazy? The fact is, video games are still evolving. They still have a long way to go, and I think that both developers and publishers are pushing games and the people who make them beyond their limits. We've come so far over the past 30 years, but I think that we're at least two or three console generations away from being able to create a fun, believable, and genuinely dynamic galaxy of this size. Bethesda tried to innovate by creating something massive, but true innovation comes from depth and fun not just sheer size. A video game should always leave you wanting more, not wishing for less. The only thing I had left to do now was go back to Sarah. She was happy to see me. And you know what? I was happy to see her too. I guess I could maybe settle down with her for real this time. We could hang out here on Cassiopeia for all eternity. Or at least until she gets uninstalled.
And of course, I've got to thank all my patrons, for without them, videos like this wouldn't really be possible. I'm able to take that Patreon money and use it on editing software, and songs, and props, and costumes, and all sorts of cool stuff. Thanks again, guys. Remember to keep your companions close, everybody. This is Ren's Reviews, signing off. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Thin thighs and your green eyes That I can use you to store all my supplies And when I shoot